Damen und Herren, jedes internationale Vertrauen in unserer Politik. To the German people, he will always be simply Der Alte, the old one. His name is Konrad Adenauer, and this is his biography. This is biography. Our story, Conrad Adenauer. For more than a decade, Chancellor Conrad Adenauer dominated German politics. It took a man of his stature, of his iron will, to rebuild a war-shattered nation into a prosperous, stable power. And it is characteristic of the aging Chancellor that he said more than once, I am worried by the thought of what will become of Germany when I am no longer here. of 85, West Germany's Chancellor Adenauer still possesses the drive, the sense of authority which has characterized his career as a politician and a statesman. Adenauer's colleagues have said, his kind of strength is elemental, instinctive. It cannot be learned. It must be born within the man. Born in Cologne in 1876, Adenauer is raised in a devoutly Catholic household. His father, Conrad Adenauer Sr., prides himself on his efficiency as a secretary in the district court of Cologne. Conrad's mother, an energetic, forceful woman, urges her son to become a professional man. As a young law student, Adenauer is somewhat reserved, aloof even at informal outings. In 1906, with his law degree, he enters the city administration in Cologne. Adenauer's initiative wins him recognition and finally promotion to the post of deputy mayor. A ruggedly good-looking young man, Adenauer's facial features are changed to an impassive, almost oriental mask by an automobile accident. Elected Lord Mayor of Cologne, he launches a massive building campaign. conservative city officials who call him Germany's most expensive mayor, Adenauer tenaciously pushes through his plan. He makes Cologne foremost among the Rhineland communities of Germany. Germany in the early 1920s is racked by confusion and post-war inflation. In 1926, Reich President von Hindenburg is fighting to hold together his chaotic Weimar Republic. Impressed by Adenauer's record in Cologne, von Hindenburg asks him to form a government. Adenauer would become chancellor, the top post in Germany. He cannot, however, muster enough votes from among the many splinter political parties. In six years, seven different men hold the post of chancellor. Taking advantage of the unrest, the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, has become active in Munich. Their leader is Adolf Hitler. Finally, in 1932, von Hindenburg selects Adolf Hitler. The aging president believes he will be able to control Hitler and his party. January 30th, 1933, Hitler and National Socialism take power in Germany. Catholic faith and his firm belief in a democratic government are diametrically opposed to the Nazi credo. When swastikas are raised in Cologne to herald a visit from Hitler, Lord Mayor Adenauer scornfully orders them taken down. Branded an anti-Nazi, 
Adenauer is unceremoniously sacked as Lord Mayor. For ten years, Adenauer lives in virtual exile, but he is constantly harassed, hounded by the Nazis for his refusal to compromise with the Third Reich. Then, in 1944, he is arrested by the Gestapo. Adenauer is finally released when his oldest son, an officer in the German army, convinces the authorities of his father's innocence. choice for the post from which the Nazis had expelled him more than 12 years before. Conrad Adenauer is once again Lord Mayor of Cologne. With the signing of the armistice, Cologne becomes part of the British zone of occupation. Within five months, Adenauer clashes with the English military governor. He stubbornly resists official orders and decides instead to carry out his own plan for the reconstruction of the shattered city. When he makes his fight public, British authorities demand his resignation. Now, in his personal file, beside the words, dismissed by the Nazis, Conrad Adenauer makes the notation, dismissed by the liberators. 1946. Conrad Adenauer is 65 years old, but now he begins to rally support for a new political party, which will break through old religious barriers, bringing together for the first time Germany's powerful Catholic and Protestant factions. He wants to be in a position to assume full leadership on the day when his nation will again have self-government. Spurred by his personal drive and persuasive powers, the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, emerges as West Germany's strongest political organization. Adenauer wastes little time in making his position in the party known. Having been born in 1876, he points out, I presume I am the oldest among those present. If no one objects, I may therefore consider myself president by seniority. Adenauer diligently recruits influential leaders to give added power to the CDU. One of these men is the brilliant Bavarian economist Dr. Ludwig Erhardt. Erhardt will create the blueprint for the industrial recovery of West Germany. By 1948, Conrad Adenauer is one of his nation's most prominent leaders, repeatedly called upon by the Allied authorities for suggestions on matters of policy. Says General Lucius Clay, U.S. military governor, admiringly, Adenauer has the intelligence and character to act as a statesman. July 1949, Adenauer concentrates his full attention on the coming election, Germany's first free election in more than 25 years. He seeks to create not only the image of the benevolent father, but of the leader whom the German people would be eager to follow.
Christian Democratic Union wins a landslide victory. At the age of 73, Conrad Adenauer is named Federal Chancellor of West Germany. Now, although his powers are still limited by Allied occupation statutes, Adenauer has grandiose plans for the future of his nation. He envisions himself as the leader who will end the centuries-old animosity between France and Germany, who will win back respect for Germany among the other Western nations. And he is fully confident that, in time, he can bring about the reunification of East and West Germany under a democratic and stable government. I believe that patience is the strongest weapon in the armory of the defeated, Adenauer says. And I possess a great deal of it. Nineteen forty-nine. With his election as federal chancellor, Conrad Adenauer now launches his program to build a new German nation from the wartime shambles. He goads his ministers, browbeats the members of parliament, ruthlessly drives himself in his effort to bring new life to a shattered country. of Germany is destroyed during the last two years of the war. The factories that might have supplied the materials for rebuilding are stripped by the Russians and shipped to the Soviet Union. Once proud cities like Stuttgart, Frankfurt, Bremen, Munich, and Berlin have been reduced to empty shells in which the people live a desperate existence of fear, suffering, and hunger.
soon swept up in what is called the Wirtschaftswunder, the modern economic miracle of recovery. To the German people, Konrad Adenauer becomes the symbol of their new prosperity and security. Chancellor rules the CDU as rigidly as he rules the German Parliament. After watching him win a marathon debate to convince party members to back his plans for a new German army, an admirer cracks, Dr. Adenauer just succeeded in removing the backbones of 270 men without shedding one drop of blood. Adenauer publicly reveals his intention to rebuild the army and the navy. He meets much stronger opposition. The German people are frankly frightened by the prospect of renewed military power. France and Russia watch warily the passing of the new draft law. Adenauer argues that it's the duty of West Germany to make a contribution to the defense of the free world that the new armed forces will give greater status to the nation and greater strength in the difficult struggle for a unified East and West Germany. With his first goal of West Germany's acceptance by the Western powers of firm reality, Chancellor Adenauer travels more and more, promoting interest in his growing nation among world leaders. Arriving here, I feel very strongly one thing. <coughs> Gratitude for the American people. I am happy to be in this wonderful country. We are working with you for peace and freedom. Foreign diplomats are pleased to deal with the democratic German government in Bonn. Says one statesman, you can get things done because Adenauer makes all the decisions. The Allied Occupation of Germany ends. For Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, it is the pinnacle of his popularity and his political achievement. day, West Germany is officially admitted as a member of NATO. The Western powers welcome a valuable new ally as the German army aligns itself with the free world in opposing communism. September 1955. Adenauer arrives in Moscow for conferences with Soviet leaders talks that many Germans hope will lay the groundwork for eventual reunification of their nation. At the conference table, however, Khrushchev and Bulganian make it clear that East Germany will remain locked behind the Iron Curtain. To the suggestion that they discuss reunification, the Soviet answer is no. In the end, Adenauer must settle simply for the return of 9,000 prisoners of war still held in Russia. January 6, 1958. Thriving on his own formula of hard work without fretting, Adenauer celebrates his 82nd birthday, surrounded by his seven children and a host of grandchildren. During his enforced idleness in the years of World War II, Gardener. The Nazis, Adenauer remarked, made me an authority on roses. By 1960, Adenauer has only fulfilled one of his major ambitions, Germany's acceptance by the Western world. Now he concentrates on the nagging problem of Franco-German relations between these powerful nations who have fought each other in two world wars. Adenauer, however, feels that he and General de Gaulle can solve all the ancient differences and misunderstandings. Adenauer and de Gaulle.
Monroe meet in Paris for one of the most historic discussions of the century. Both men are closely matched in outlook, power, and ambition for their respective nations. They frame a treaty they are certain will bring France and Germany together in a lasting bond of friendship and cooperation. Conrad Adenauer is 85. Although he has previously set a date for his retirement, he now declares his intention to run for yet another term as chancellor. But now his advancing years are taking their toll. His once firm hold on German politics is beginning to weaken. He is fine in the morning, says one of his closest days, but after lunch and a short nap, it is difficult to keep his attention fixed. December 1962. The Adenauer administration becomes involved in a national controversy. Der Spiegel, a news magazine, in an article highly critical of Defense Minister Strauss, reveals secret facts on the German army and NATO. Editors of Der Spiegel are arrested. The magazine shut down. The wave of national resentment is directed against the aging chancellor. In the furor which follows, the leaders of his own CDU are more determined than ever that Adenauer hold to his original promise to retire. Adenauer stubbornly fights for the right to choose his successor. His party, the CDU, names economic minister Ludwig Erhardt as its candidate. Erhardt is a rubber lion, Adenauer snorts. He prefers to avoid a struggle where possible. But Der Alta is forced to give in and accept the party's decision. At the age of 87, Konrad Adenauer prepares to step down. He has been Chancellor of West Germany for 14 years. Adenauer has cleared the ruins as a high official in Bonn. The old one's successors must now complete the building of the new Germany. But when the German people themselves are asked in a national poll, who has done the most for Germany in its long history? Their choice as number one is Der Alta, Konrad Adenauer. The German people have always needed and followed a powerful leader. Konrad Adenauer has been such a figure. At times, his critics claimed that he had acquired too much power, that he had become a virtual dictator. Adenauer answered the charges bluntly. My wish is that sometime in the future, when mankind looks beyond the dust of our times, he said, it can be said of me that I have done my duty. Mike Wallace for biography.